the first week when I got here, I was actually staying in hostels with like six other girls because I was trying to save my money. But um, I wrote a song two days after I moved to LA named Leave and I got a uh, publishing deal with Universal and they gave me like $100,000. I was like, okay, thank you. I appreciate you being here. Yeah, thanks for having us. It's yeah, thank you. Honor. Of course. Uh, this is about you both and your journey in music and how you got to where you are now. Awesome. And of course, we'll talk about uh, the record you put out as well. <laughs> that amazing record. I love it. I love it. I was just listening Which to it. Which one's your favorite? Months. I like Stuck. It's a little more upbeat. Yeah, yeah for sure. It's I more mean, bubby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Reflex is, it, they're both awesome songs, but the other one starts a little slower. I was I was jamming to the, yeah. <laughs> the first yeah. one. Stuck is more like an instant impact than like Reflex. Right, exactly. Is, reflex is like, <laughs> you got to sit and cry. <laughs> but it builds up. It does build up halfway through. I mean, in the middle of the song. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, cool. Well, I appreciate, again, you both being here. Uh, let's start with you, Marion. Where were you born and raised? Um, <clears throat> I was born in Mauritania when I was six months old. My parents um, took the last plane out of Mauritania and fled, fled to Senegal. My parents are Senegalese and Mauritanian too, because there was a war between Senegal and Mauritania. So I was raised in Senegal until I was seven years old. And then I moved to the Bronx. I lived to the Bronx, in the Bronx most of my life. And now I'm here. Wow. In LA. Okay. So yeah, so you okay, you're you're there in Senegal till you're seven, is that what you said? Yeah. Do you have any memories of it or I do. Okay. I have really good memories and I go back very often because there's you do. so many yeah. I do shoot music videos there. I work with like the artists there. Some of my um good designer friends are fashion designer friends are um from there. And um I just like to go and you know show up for my people and Go reconnect because it's so it's so amazing. You guys should go, Spencer. I'm trying to take you to Senegal one day. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> I have like a I go I have like a whole um, DJ set <laughs> at the Tree of Life. <laughs> yeah, that would be that, sick. <laughs> that would be sick. Do you did you have, do you go back to like where you were at growing up there or not? Yeah, yeah. Really? Wow. Yeah. yeah. Is it different than when you were there? Obviously. Yeah, because my um yeah my grandparents are dead. <clears throat> and um, the house, we used to have like a really huge house. I mean, it was a religious house, but it was a really huge house and there was a lot of um, community and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it was cool. The vibe was cool. Um, but it's, it's way different now because like everybody has grown up. Sure. <laughs> everybody like my cousins all are different. They have kids now. They have like their own houses and stuff. So it's, um, but it's cool to go back all the time. And I'm mm -hmm. discovering different parts of um, Senegal when I go there because I'm discovering it through the lens of an artist now, you know, so there's like different vibes and not just a kid who grew up there um, in a religious house. <laughs> sure. sure. Oh, so you grew up in a religious house. What about music? Was that uh, prominent in the house at all or no? No, I was encouraged not to sing. <laughs> really? Yeah. I didn't I was, know that. Wow. Yeah, I was encouraged not to sing. So I was traumatized for the longest time when I would go on stage. I would remember... My mom telling me that if I sang, I would go to hell. But it was her way of reeling me in. <laughs> wow. Okay. So it was a whole thing. Spencer, you don't know about this? Oh, no, no, I never heard this. This, this. Yeah, this is why. But you know what? The pain gives you range. So I'm, I'm grateful for it. <laughs> I would imagine that a religious household, that would kind of be like no, celebrated not in a Muslim, sense. Like, not Islam. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So not allowed to sing. And then how do you eventually convince your, your parents? Like, not mm, only I am, not, am I, I going to sing, I'm just going to, I'm going to do it professionally. <laughs> well, I actually didn't convince them. Um, they, they came around Okay. after I told them that uh, I have my own life. You can't control me. Thank you very much. And I love and respect you, but this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> how old and, are you when you decided to start singing? Uh, Man, I, I could sing for a long time because I used to like do little girl groups with my <laughs> sisters and stuff. So we loved it. But my sisters have always been a supportive. Like my, my older sister would be like, parents, you need to let this girl sing. She's going to make us money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. So and, yeah. And then um, <laughs> I didn't I didn't like really, really start. I, I moved to L.A. Uh, when I was like 27. Oh, okay. I didn't really start till later because I was just like going through pains. Running, running away from my parents, ran to Italy, ran to Peruvian jungle, 
ran everywhere to find myself and like just be like okay I'm gonna be sad if I don't do this so I'm just gonna do it and there's I, I don't care anymore <laughs> so they came around now so they until love you're... and send, send it to everybody but it wasn't until you're 27 when you moved to LA yeah. and decided like hey this is what I'm gonna do yeah for sure Oh, wow. So before well, no, I, just... I mean, I always knew that that's what I was going to do, but I didn't have the courage to do it until then. Cause I thought if I did one thing, I would lose my parents. You know what I mean? Cause sure. they're so disapproving. So it was like a whole thing. Oh, Lord. Oh, I don't like goodness. to think about those times. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. To, I'm sorry to bring up that wreckage. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, when I say I don't like to think about those times, meaning like it was just, it was just very troubled times for me. Cause I like, I did everything to suppress that pain. And I just realized sure. that I could not do it anymore. Mm-hmm. And that I had to just go after my calling. Okay. Yeah. Well, and what about you, Spencer? You were born where in Bay Area, is that what I saw? Correct, yeah, I was born in the Bay Area and um, I moved to uh, Dow- I moved to SoCal for a bit and then I moved to Dallas for, for middle and high school. So I had like a very, like- Oh, wow. Probably the most- like one of the most liberal places to live and then one of the most conservative places to live. <laughs> I was I, about to uh, say, uh, really? Clash. Polar opposites of of like life in the United States growing up. Like half of my life was in the most liberal place and half of my life was in the most conservative place. So I feel like it gave me a, a, a good perspective of-, of Your seeing, balance. You know, yeah, both sides yeah. of everything <laughs> and hearing everyone's voice. And so I think that really shaped the way I, I think and and I'm I'm just very open-minded to- everything you know <laughs> sure wow okay so you're in the bay you said then you moved to southern california yeah after the bay i moved to newport Beach just for a few years okay. uh, my dad's job moved there and then we moved to dallas when his job was there um i'm currently in la but i'm moving back to the bay area um in a few maybe like six months or something why I you're moving back yeah, yeah, but I'll be in LA all the time. Like it's it's so easy. It's so why am easy. I just hearing about this, Spencer? <laughs> I feel like I'm moving. The thing is, you guys are learning was, so much about you're yourself. Moving back. Each other. He, he lives. He lives a couple of blocks from me. I know. So, uh, the LA was always back is devastating. It, but but I'm, I'm but I'm gonna be here like a week every month. Like mm-hmm. I, I no, it's true. I just miss. I miss my family. I miss like. Oh yeah. The, the no, that's, I miss that's very dog. important. Yeah. Like, I miss like for me like being in San Francisco and making music is great because I'm like away from the 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 scene and the this and the that and everyone's like doing this and everyone's doing that i can just like focus on my own thing and we can like i can just you know it's just away from everything i prefer to be away from everything like in my own space you know what Mm -hmm. i mean like really focusing on what i'm doing um because i think this was this was always a temporary thing this is actually i was only going to be here for a year during covid but it was really fun so i did another year But, oh, in um, LA, really? Yeah, yeah. It was supposed to be okay. just a year, but we're doing. I'm pushing two and a half now, coming up. Um, wow, super fun. But but I'm gonna move back. Um, there you go. I school. lived in. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm from San Diego, and then I moved to the Bay Area for uh, a handful of years, and then nice. back to San Diego. So, and then now I'm in Nashville. But yeah, <laughs> it, it's definitely two different worlds: Northern California versus Southern California. For sure, for sure. Uh, but it's so convenient to come to LA, and yeah, it's not hard. Right, Miriam's here. Every, all my all my friends are here. Like I'm here. Yeah, it's super <laughs> easy to come back. It's it's like a hour flight. Like it, that's nothing. <laughs> sure. Oh, okay. So if I call you at like three in the morning, and I'm like, <clears throat> I have a song that we need to do. I won't be able to just come to your studio. Yeah, but we can, I could. You can zoom in. No, I'm not trying to make you feel bad, Spencer. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm just devastated, but it's all good. All right, well, how did you get into music? Did I see you started drums at like infant age? Yeah, yeah. When I was two, I started playing the drums. Um, How did that even begin? Your parents uh, musical? No, they're not musical. Uh, I was an only child and I would like, I was, I just, loved music since I was born just it was like my heart and soul I would always just like listen my earliest memories are like sitting in the living room just playing my dad's tapes and CDs just sitting there messing with like the EQ settings on our on our home system and I was banging on the pots and pans my mom got really frustrated uh, because I was always putting out all the pots and pans and (laughs) and making beats and uh, so she got me like a little baby drum set when I was two (laughs) And I played drums every single day uh, from <laughs> when I was two until, you know, like pretty much forever. I t- did music after that. And I started playing guitar. I started playing bass. I started playing piano. I started playing all these different instruments. And then 
I got, right. I was, I hit the point where I'm like, I can play all these instruments and like, what, what now, what, what, what can I do now? So then I, I got into recording when I was like eight years old or something. I started like making, what? What? Oh yeah. my like God. Baby Wait a second. What's yeah. going on here? You're like, I started learning all these instruments. I'm thinking, okay, so he's gotta be about 16, 17 at this time. And then right. I'm turning eight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I was when I was eight or nine, I got a little uh, a little recorder so I could like play drums, play guitar, and like write my own music. So I started I started producing. When oh I was eight. my gosh! Do you have any of that still? Somewhere deep in some archive, I have some tapes. Yeah, yeah. That's I incredible. Deep, deep down inside. Oh my <laughs> gosh! Okay, so eight years old, you're already putting together like full songs and playing all the I mean, instruments it on doesn't, it. It doesn't sound like incredible. Obviously, it's just me noodling around on drums. But and still, uh, noodling around. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, it's so funny because we have like the completely different upbringings. Like you were pushed into music, and you like started so young. Well, they didn't like push me. I just did it. I just did it. Like that's they they were just like I was just an only child and I was just like sitting at home and like I'm like I wasn't interested in playing with the trucks. I wasn't interested in going outside. I wasn't interested in playing sports. I did play I did play baseball, but it's like I was just really just all I wanted to do all day is just make music. And that's it's still I'm 28 now and I'm still doing this. That's all you've been doing. <laughs> my whole life, so, yeah. Well, you did go to Duke, right? I did. I did. I studied. So, yeah, uh, let, let's just say you've, you've done other things, but uh, yeah, but it's, it, I was still doing music while I was there. Sure. I was like maybe a little uh, uh, like I gave up a lot of sleep while I was there because I was trying to work on my engineering stuff and make music. And I was touring mm -hmm. at the Vici at the time while I was in yeah, college. So, so crazy. Like that is so crazy. Started. You were yeah. touring with the Vici while you were in college? Yeah, when I was 19, how, I started touring. How did your college friends feel about that? Were, you, were they like, oh, I got this coolest friend or something? That's what I'm wondering. Uh, I was, I'm, I'm kind of just like a, like a chill kind of laid back kind of quiet person. So I'm, I, I would just, I would just kind of be the, and I wouldn't go out very much when I was in college. I went out quite a bit senior year, but not really elsewhere. Uh, so my room was always like everyone would go out and party and I'd be making beats while everyone's partying. And then everyone would come to my room at like two or three in the morning for the late night. And I'd be like making beats and everyone would be like hanging out in my room, you know, at three in the morning. So kind of how <laughs> oh my God. Gosh. Well, okay. So you said at eight is when you're writing songs and kind of recording yourself. Like when does the DJing thing happen? Like when do you start yeah, making I, beats and, and DJing? I started DJing when I was in seventh grade. So 12 years old. <laughs> um, I played my first show when I was 12. Well, not show. I played like it was a seventh grade, like mixer, like a, like a, my seventh, it was for my seventh grade class. And then I started uh -huh. playing like proms and stuff around dallas like <laughs> proms and like bar mitzvahs bat mitzvahs that's like how i learned how to dj like because because in those scenarios you no one cares who you are you know you just need to keep people dancing so i really learned how to read a crowd and play for mm -hmm. hours and hours and hours i could play for four or five hours and like try to keep the crowd the whole time and that was that was my early education of how to dj and still to this day i don't plan any of my sets i don't know what i'm going to play when i step up there i have no i have not a clue even what I wow yeah I don't even know I come in with maybe 150 tracks um, a lot of them are mine some of them are really undiscovered music that that people don't know and I I just wing it the whole time it depends on the energy and the vibe of the room it's a feedback loop I play something I look at the energy and I, I it's like it's like a it's like a breathing organism it's not like a, oh I'm just playing these tracks like that's how I like to play it's like so deep yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Absolutely. I love that you play like unknown stuff. I think that's the coolest thing about uh, that genre is that you are presenting songs that people haven't heard yet and versions of songs people haven't heard. No. And they're it's listening to it the first time and they're excited about that. It's like a band has to come out and they'll play some songs and then it's like, play the hits. You know, yeah. you get to go out and like play stuff that no one's ever heard and, and, and see how they react to it. It might not even be your song. Exactly. And I found as long as you kind of play one, two, maybe three of the tracks that everyone like really came to hear, they you can play, you know, 90% <laughs> undiscovered stuff for the rest. And, and there's no better feeling like it's a great feeling playing a hit and getting a great reaction, seeing everyone explode like the room. But that's an even better feeling for me playing something no one's heard before and then exploding the room like that's that's like for me, that's like that means I chose the right track in that moment. And I'm like, I know that no one has heard this before and I'm going to play it. And then you watch the room go off and you're like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy, you know, cause that, but, but this creates a, a people come 
to show after show after show after show because sure. they know when they're going to see me play that they're going to hear stuff they've never heard. And even if they came to last night's show, I have people who I see in the airport and they're like, oh, I'm coming to your show tonight too. And then it's like, that's an honor for me because they know that it's going to be completely different the day after. Like that's no huge. steps are remotely similar, you know? Wow. Dude. I'm just curious. Cause I'm kind of ignorant to this when it comes to you coming out and playing like a song that nobody's ever heard before or something like that. It's like, are people like, like shazamming it? Like if I was like, Oh damn, I really want to learn, like know what this song is. Or are you posting like a set list or like, how would somebody then know what you played like in the middle of your set? And they're kind of like, Oh, I want to know what that song is. Like that's kind of the, that's the fun of it. So okay. uh, sometimes I get videos, like people will take a video and they'll send it to me uh, or I'll they'll put, put it online. Like what on earth is this track? And uh, sometimes, you know, I'll say what it is. Like if it's someone else's track, you know, I'll tell them, but uh, sometimes if it's my own or some, some secret track, my friend sent me or something, I, I, that's part of the mystique, like the, the mystery of, of the sets. And I think that's really important because a lot of the artists I really look up to, the DJs I look up to play a lot of really unknown music in their sets. And that's that's part of the fun for me. When I want to go out, I want to hear people play stuff that blows my mind. And I have no idea even what they're playing, what country it's coming from. I have no idea where the music is. And that's that's part of the fun. Like mm -hmm. I, th there's, there's something beautiful about not knowing. Uh, like as a fan and as a DJ, it's like I want some of the tracks I play, I want people to, to have no idea what country it's coming from, where, who it is, and just let the music speak for itself. It's like, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter who it is. It's just like, let it, let it do its thing, you know? And that's, that's some of the beauty of shows for me. Yeah. That's rad. Like that just, yeah, like I said, it's something that I haven't ever really wrapped my head around when it comes to that. Like, I, I, spend, I think that's I so cool. Hours and hours a day digging for music that no one knows. Like I, that's part that's of my crazy. routine of the day. Huh? But that's crazy. And yeah. I know you do too, because I see you in your room, <laughs> in your studio, like just doing stuff all the time. And it's just like, yeah, how do you find the time? It, it, it's passion. <laughs> so you just always find the time. It's like, I maybe in a digging, if I'm digging for two or three hours for music, maybe I'll find one or two tracks that really work in my steps. And it's like three hours to find like that one golden track that has 200 plays on Spotify, you know, no one knows where it's from. It's some obscure label from some random country. And then that is a track that becomes a staple on my set, you know? Yeah, that's so crazy. And then, I mean, I bet you there's so many artists that have kind of broke that way because somebody like you was just like, I found this song. And then maybe enough buzz gets around it that that 200 plays turns into 200,000. Or, or if I see a DJ who I really appreciate and I get a Shazam and it says like five Shazams on it, I'm like, yes, I found like a golden little nugget. There and I <laughs> song, then I can go play it out at my shows. And maybe that that is how like an artist can get discovered, like through, yeah. through playing that, you know, and I'm not trying to be all secretive and not tell anyone. No, no. Part of the magic and part of the fun of, of, of live music is, is not knowing, but it sounds great. I love it. I love it. Well, I'm I'm curious. I want I'm gonna talk to you, Spencer, about the Avicii thing because I I'm really fascinated by that. But um, Miriam, when when you move to LA, like how do you kind of get your your footing and break into into the industry, especially not being able to really sing and make that a, a career path until you're much. I mean, 27. Yeah. So before that, I was just um, after I did the whole college thing, mm -hmm. graduated. Like as I like to say, these get degrees. I <laughs> I studied abroad in London. Wow. Um, <laughs> Music like, or obviously not because your family was <clears throat> No, I was doing communications and journalism. Oh, so I was like, that's what I did. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I was like, I was like, you know, I need to find a way to be famous somehow because I can't be a singer. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> and then I was going to, I was, I was going to be like, I was like, I was going to be a sports journalist or something. That's only because I was wanting to, I like the soccer players. And I was like, maybe I can hang out on, you know, around the <laughs> maybe I can hang out with the soccer yeah. players. <laughs> <laughs> and then <laughs> after college, I moved to Italy. I spent like a, um, uh, uh, almost a year in Italy. And that's when I started doing open mics and stuff. I would go to the clubs and like in the piazza and in, in the, the restaurants in the piazza. And I'll be like, oh, I can sing, let me sing and stuff. So I like try to force people to let me sing. They will let me sing. Up until I was trying to hit high notes and I didn't really, I never took training and stuff like that. So it was just haywire and they're like, you have a very good voice that you need to train. I was like, yes, you're right. <laughs> so I used to do like open mics there and stuff. So um, I came back and then um, um, 
I just like got into dance music really too. And um, <clears throat> when I came back, I was like um, doing some uh, improv stuff for some DJs at some parties that my friends used to throw in New York at some ballrooms and stuff. So I just got some training there on the mm -hmm. spot. Like I was singing with the DJs. Um, and then um, I had wait waitressing jobs <laughs> and I, I saved some money up. I had like $500 when I moved to LA and I was like, I'm gonna make this happen. Um, on the, the first week when I got here, I was actually staying in hostels with like six other girls because I was trying to save my money. But um, I wrote a song two days after I moved to LA named Leave and I got a uh, publishing deal with Universal and they gave me like $100,000. I was like, okay, thank you. <laughs> oh my <laughs> gosh, that worked nicely. <laughs> it did. Follow your dreams, people. Follow wow. your dreams. Wow. Okay, so you had this song. Well, how does Universal find it? Are you just knocking um, on doors? Yeah, saying, the, the, hey, um, so I had like a, ma a kind of management situation set up when I when I got here. So they, they set it, they set up um, with the producer for me to go in with the producer and we wrote the song on the first sit down. On the first day, I wrote the song called Leave. <laughs> and um, they, they sent it to Universal and Universal, this guy named Jason Markey, who's, um has his own company too, but is... Um, under Universal, he sent it to he sent the, the song to Jody Jody Gersha. She's the mm -hmm. um, head of Universal and was like, "Can I sign her?" And she wrote back in capital letters, "Yes." <laughs> nice. Whoa. And that's what happened. <laughs> and then do you call your parents and are you like, "Hey, I told you this music yeah, right? should have worked out. You should have let me sing as a young age." <laughs> <laughs> but I, I understand their concerns because they're like, sure. "Oh, you know." Draw um, uh, musicians are just the drug addicts and blah 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 because they're, they're only two examples with Amy Winehouse and Whitney Houston. I'm like, you know oh. what? Not everybody's like that. Just <laughs> <laughs> you sure, I sure. Understand sure. Their concern. <laughs> okay, wow, that's incredible. And then from there, you were just like off to the races writing with different yeah. people. And I mean, yeah. you've had a bunch of songs, a bunch of sinks. Yeah, I mean, it took, it took a while to find my footing, and just I, I know I had to learn the business and I. I didn't have a manager for a while because I had to step back and just, you know, really think about why I was doing this in the first place. Cause you can, you know, your whys can get lost in the business mm -hmm. of just trying to numbers and stuff and like not doing things that you actually want to do. Um, so I just stepped back and I was like, I'm going to take my career into my own hands. And I was very intentional about who I want to work with. If I like something, I'm going to go with it. Like, Spencer, I his remix one of my, one of my my songs. Actually, it's not a remix. You actually produced it because I only had vocals and I wanted to do it differently. And I heard it, and it was so different than anything I've ever heard. At first, I was like, "This is not how I heard it." But then I was like, "I have to let go and surrender." It was kind of like ayahuasca. Have you ever done ayahuasca? No, I have not. I've heard about it. I've heard things. So when you about when it. you do ayahuasca, people tell you exactly how it's gonna be. They're like, "Oh, this is what." But when while you're in it, if you don't let go of your expectations then you'll never really experience the medicine and stuff. And so mm -hmm. with this track that Spencer did, which is one of my favorite tracks in the world and I can't wait to release it with him. Um, <laughs> I didn't know what to expect at first. And when I first heard it, it was completely different than what I was thinking it was gonna be. Cause I was just like, you know, piano world. And I was like, this shit is dope. <laughs> and then we just started working together. <laughs> oh, so that song had been done prior to this project that you no, 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 together? No, 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 it was another oh. song that's not out yet. We've done right, like right. seven songs or something. Yeah, we have, uh, okay, yeah. gotcha. We got a bunch of songs. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, that's that's incredible. That's crazy. So, Spencer, you like what? When do you get this break? When you're in college? Is it in college that obviously like Avicii has to find your music somewhere? And how did that happen? Well, when I was in I was in high school and I was I was working really hard at my music. I was DJing all the time and locally in Dallas, like as I said, and I was. Mm -hmm producing as much as possible and then I really fell in love with house music and I was sending my demos out to you know dozens maybe a hundred plus labels and managers and stuff just getting no response or rejections just over and over and over and over and over and then one day I sent my face I sent a Facebook message to Avicii's manager saying please give me one chance I sent him this this track I was working on and then he's like Hey, this is really good. I'll send it to Tim. And I was not expecting a response. And then he liked it. And then he played it. He played it. And then Avicii played my track. And I was in high school at the time. So I was like, Oh, he played it during a set? Uh, like on his radio show. He put it oh, on whoa. Level podcast. And I was like, What? Like, that's so crazy. That's that is the day, nuts. That's the day where I was like, If Avicii's playing my track, then like, 
I think I can make a career out of this, you know, but I didn't like go for it. You know, I still went to college and stuff, but I was like, at least this is, this is maybe something I could do. Like, he got where, validated obviously by that moment. I sent, I just kept on sending demos to, to his manager and, and to their team. And eventually they liked two of the tracks I sent. And then they signed those two tracks. This is when I was 19. I think I was a freshman or sophomore in college. And then, then I started touring and then um, Above and Beyond started opening with one of those tracks and Dead Mouse found my music through him. And then what? I saw that whole, like, it just, it, I, I always tell up and coming producers and people asking for advice. It's like, if you are making music that, like good music will just spread itself. Like you, people are like, how do you break in? It just takes one person to like play your music or recognize your music or whatever. And then it just naturally just spreads. Like if, if it is something that's really fresh like a wildfire moment, yeah it just it just spreads itself you don't i think this sounds a bit crazy but it's almost like not being shoving it in people's faces like does more than like letting the music speak for itself and like do its rounds mm -hmm. for me i've found that that that's a more effective way than than like than like hammering and listen, listen, listen to this. Listen, to this. <laughs> like letting people like discover the music, I think adds some some mystique around the music. Sure, I mean that makes a lot of sense because once you start seeing, I mean, I'm it's even more so now with like you know TikTok and Instagram and everything. Somebody's gonna put out a song. It's just like new song. It's like all over the place, and yeah, it yeah. might turn you off from even <laughs> listening to it or even paying attention to it. It's yeah. it's. I, once again, I think if, if it's really good and it's really game changing music, um, it will naturally spread itself. And, mm -hmm. and that also, like with that said, you know, you have to be really conscious about what you're releasing. And, and like for me, I make, you know, hundreds and hundreds of tracks and ideas all the time. And I think the key is like really finding the really powerful music that doesn't sound like anything else. And that's the one that you want to put out. Like if you sound mm -hmm. like a copycat version of some other track that exists it's okay to like learn in production or whatever but but that if whatever the idea that was already exists so it's like don't put that out you know like you you it's really important to put out stuff that doesn't sound like anyone else is really like down 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 when it comes down to it that's the most important thing for me that if it sounds great and it sounds unique that's what i'm looking for okay and with with that like when you play a set or with with these songs or new songs you said you you have hundreds of songs that you would put out do you test them out at like a like like a DJ night and then see if people react to it. And if they do enough times, then it's like, okay, this is something maybe I'll, I'll share and put out. Absolutely. That's a hundred percent. So a lot of those songs that I make that, that aren't even intended to be released there, uh, they, they can be tools in my set. So I, that's why, again, people come to show after show after show and, and maybe hear these special tracks that they can only hear at the show and they're nowhere online. They're nowhere mm -hmm. else. You can't, you can't hear any of this music unless you come to my show because it's, it's a, it's stuff that I wrote that isn't supposed to be released. It's it's just music for my sets. I make some tools. I make some 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 stuff that's a bit off the beaten path that I wouldn't necessarily want to release, but it mm -hmm. works really well at the show. So that's and as you said, when there are those couple tracks that I'm playing out that really get a crazy reaction, where I'm like the room is going nuts right now, um, and it happens again and again and again, and I know that that that's maybe one to release because. If, if my reactions are really good, then other DJs reactions will probably be good. And that's, that's something that's really helped my career. When I, when I released, you know, a track and then let's say my track windows 95 on acid, I released that like four years ago or something. That was a huge break for me mm -hmm. because I hadn't put out techno before, like more hard, dark stuff. And then that one, uh, what's his face Fisher played that on like the main stage at Tomorrowland and he played it in Brazil and like all these places and all of a sudden Sasha's playing it and like Calvin Harris is playing it and like all yeah. these people start playing it because everyone's playing it and it hits number one on the techno charts and all of a sudden I'm Crazy. like yeah then all of a sudden I'm like I can make techno too you know I can make techno I can make house I can do, you can do it all yeah exactly <laughs> so, but, yeah. I believe in you yeah <laughs> Wow. 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 So well, talented. You, no, for real. Both of you are. Both yeah. of you are. Well, no, but he's so he's just really good. He's like a um, I, I call him a, a pocket master. <laughs> 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 like you are in the pocket every single time. Just, I feel like you just get it. Yes, that's why we work well together. I, it's see like there. The I know way. we're in a room, but we're also in a flow state. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> Spencer, how you doing? <laughs> yeah. 
That's amazing. Um, with you, you're going to Duke, Spencer. What was like the what career were you chasing aside from music? Like when you were going there, was there like a um, career path that you wanted to do? Uh, I was really into, and I still am. I'm into the technology behind music creation. I was studying signal processing and acoustics, and I did my oh, okay. omnidirectional speaker. It's like a speaker. That I built a speaker from scratch, really. Um, and I'm really, I'm really into the technology. But my my heart is in the music. And like, sure, I just realized when I graduated, I'm like, I if I'm not going to go for music full time right now, and I kind of get a job while working on music, then music work like being a musician isn't going to happen like i realized if i start working for a company then i'm gonna have to you know continue going up the ranks of the company and like getting my salary and it doesn't give mm -hmm. me enough time to make music so i told my family give me six months at home uh right after college and i will either have a career or not have a career so i just sat in the guest room and made music for 16 hours a day basically seven days a week uh and it wasn't working after six months so i was like give me three more and so then after nine i moved to san francisco barely able to to support myself you know i was making one pot of food for like three days i would do the same thing for three days uh wow. I, could, I could barely pay the bills i was playing opening gigs for like 500 bucks like it was and and without even travel you know included in that so I, I could barely survive for that first year in 2017 or whatever that was yeah. wow and then what was what changed like was it that record you're talking about earlier it was i put out a mix album my first album called illusion of perfection that yeah i think is when people started to understand what i was doing um and then that led to my own my first headline tour and then that followed by a techno number one. So it was like a house, like progressive house, kind of melodic thing. Mm -hmm. And then that hit number one. And then my techno number one, and then another techno number one and a couple other releases. And then it's just like that string of things. And then I released another album and it's, I think it's just the string of unexpected releases, I think really gave me a career where mm -hmm. if I, could, if I'm a one trick pony, and I'm doing one thing, mm -hmm. I would definitely have a career, but it was the fact that then that would work and then I would go way over to the other side and release something hard and dark and then it would still work and it was resonating with people. Then I would go release something really chill and deep and then that was resonating with people. And it was like the constant switch flip flop of what I was doing and what the sound was, as long as it still has that kind of flow that I like to produce. What I like mm -hmm. to think of is I think finding your sound as an artist is not a good way to think about it i think it's much more it's much better to find okay. your flow to your flow <laughs> then you can incorporate different vibes different sounds different styles but it maintains a signature flow and you can incorporate a lot more things and be diverse and i think that's really mm -hmm. important so for me it was just being diverse and releasing you know and still good you know you mm -hmm. it resonate if it's trash you know that's not it's not good, but uh, <laughs> sure. Yeah, if you're proud of the music and it's diverse, I think that's what helped me have a career. Wow. I, when I moved to San Francisco, that was the first time I really understood, like, or even really heard, uh, like, EDM. That was like, it wasn't a thing when I was in Southern California. And then I moved there, and it was like all all over the place. I mean, I worked. I used to work radio and and work in alternative radio. And when I moved to San Francisco. They did on the alternative station I was on. They had like an EDM show at night, like that ran overnight and. DJ Shadow would do it, and they had like Calvin Harris, and like it was like that. It was when Dead Mouse was doing like uh, Outside Lands headlining sets. It was like I was like, "What is this world?" And it, I, I had never heard of it. And then I'm like, yeah. it was such a big thing that I felt like, whoa, like what? Like, I was totally missing this whole thing. But that's interesting that you went to San Francisco too, because I felt like that was such a big hub of a lot of that music. I, I love it because people there are so open-minded and you're surrounded. I love being surrounded by like people pushing tech for me. That's like, that's inspiring for me. It's like mm -hmm. not, that's a good point too. I didn't me, think about that's that. the most inspiring for me when people are like pushing the boundaries of tech and I'm around all these tech people who are really into like, like the next generation of technology and new sounds and how can we make it, you know, in the next mm -hmm. world and, that's what's inspiring futurism futuristic nostalgia is what i like something that sounds familiar but it's also really futuristic i think i like that's that's like my goal in my music honestly yeah i like that futuristic nostalgia that's cool yeah. is it is it futuristic i mean is, is it um the nostalgia part because the futuristic part um helps you remember or is it something you had 
before. I think you know what I mean? Familiar, like, something in your heart. Something yeah, something familiar, familiar right? Like, yeah. Something familiar, but then it's also something you haven't heard. And I, I like that balance of, of like a sound that, and I hear right now I'm super inspired because I'm hearing this crazy music that's it's coming out of, I think a couple um, uh, French producers are, are doing a certain sound and I'm really, really into the certain sound that I've been discovering right now. And it's really only bubbling year one, year two of the sound. And it's really inspiring for me and it's really futuristic music. And so I'm, 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 I'm listening to a lot of this certain kind of specific, very niche. It's not that big right now, but I think it's going to really be a sound of the future. Yeah. That's cool. I love that you're like a tastemaker when it comes to that stuff too. Like you're really like fine, like seeking out cool music and then presenting it to people like in a, in a big setting and seeing what works and what's not going to work. Passion. for you. It's just, I passion. love that. It's, it's not that it, when it comes down to it, it's just, this is, this is what I would do, whether I have a job in it or not, I'm doing the same thing. So I'm just lucky <laughs> to have a job in it. <laughs> right. And you'd rather be broke, not doing it. I mean, you'd rather be broke doing it than not do it, right? Yeah, literally. I would, I'm in the I same boat, too. The same thing. I just got really lucky that I can live off it, but it's like, if I couldn't live off it, I'd still, uh, when I'd, whenever I'd finish work, I'd be digging for music, right, when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> Miriam, when did you meet Spencer? When did your guys' relationship start? I've known Spencer since um, 1858. <laughs> That's a specific year. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I chose that year. I was going to say 19 something, but I'm like, that's not far back enough. Um, <laughs> so when did we meet Spencer? Well, we actually met in person during the pandemic. We met during um, the 2020 lockdown. Yeah, well, He uh, came over to my uh, house to, to um, we did stuff for the first time we met. Yeah. So the first, that wasn't a song yet? You guys wrote it the first time you no, met? No, we made it in our living room. We, we made yeah. it in our living room. Oh my God. Well, so how did the... Hey, come over to the house. Let's make some music start. She, um, she sent me that yeah. idea uh, that she asked me to produce that we were talking about earlier, and I just did my thing on it. And then it's it okay. So that was the first. That was the first bit. So it was she all sent online. you that. That was all yeah, online. And then so she sent you that song that we haven't heard yet. Or no, it was um, uh, somebody uh, that we were working with. Um, uh, what's his name? I forgot. Uh, David Brady, I think. But he he's he's the one that hook, um, hooked us up and sent the vocals to you because I didn't know you at that time. Because all, all I did was um, the first time I ever discovered you was I heard what you did with the song, and then we started talking. Like we just connected, and we connected on Instagram, and it was like, oh, we should work together more. And then we had each other's number, and he was like, oh, I'm moving here, and I was like, okay, cool. And then I uh, and then we were, you sent me the the instrumental to to stuck, and um, I remember I I didn't really know what to do with it, and that's where the yeah 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 parts came in because like we, you were Spencer's like come on let, let's record it, and then I was I was like yes let's let's do this. So I I love the track, but like um, even though I was in the EDM world, like it was just a, such a progressive track that I I didn't I didn't feel like my vocals were needed in it. You know what I mean? Like it was such mm -hmm. a good track on its own. But um, he came and luckily I had like a little uh, uh, recording situation set up because I thought I would be depressed if I was not making music during the pandemic. So um, so we, we, were, we recorded the stuck parts and then like we, were, we, we did the whole thing then. And it was just so crazy because I didn't, it was just, <laughs> we didn't know what would come of it, but it was just so good. And then he sent it to me. I, I remember I was on an airplane. He sent it to me and I was just dancing on the aisle. And I turned around to my boyfriend. I was like, oh my God, this is so hot. <laughs> He's like, you're in public, man. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. So once that song was done, did you know you're going to do another record together? And yeah. you put this project yeah, out? It's just, we're, yeah. we're, first and foremost, I think with anyone, uh, singer, or producer, anything, it's like, I need to get along with them as humans. And we, mm -hmm. Miriam and I have such a deep connection as humans. I think that's like as a, as a friend and and we have very similar mentality uh i think that's so for sure important. like you can't I, for me i have to make music with someone on the same wavelength uh mm -hmm. if you're not passionate about the music or just the, that it you that has to be the number one most important thing you both are passionate about the music and that's what you're doing you know mm -hmm. for sure yeah for, and you, so, you were talking about a residency earlier Miriam. is are you both doing that together um, or no. Well, I hope Spencer joins me in my last night of residency so we can play these songs live. Okay. Because um, I'm just going off your Instagram. You have a couple more. Oh, uh, yeah. Shows, yeah. Right? I have a, um, so I'm playing. I have, uh, there's a place called the Sunrose Music Room. 
-hmm. is inside of a social club named the Brightly, which is inside of the Pendry Hotel on Sunset Avenue. Okay. And it's where all the old House of Blues used to be. Oh, so right, right, first, okay. Yeah, so I have the old first residency there. Like Jeff Goldblum has a night there. <laughs> wow. And um, uh, um, what's that guy's name? David Bowie's um, pianist. He has a night there too. Nicole Scherzinger just had a um, couple of nights there, but I have the first residency. So I'm doing, I did yesterday and I'm doing um, Tuesday the 10th and uh, Tuesday the 17th. So I have three nights there. It's really that's cool. A, that's really cool. And are you yeah. just, so you, hopefully you guys will get together and do, do these records together. I know. He's, I, I, yeah, I want coming to. through. I want to desperately. I want to go support her, but my my agent said I have radius clauses, which means like at a festival, if you sign up to play a festival, oh you're yeah, not allowed yeah. to play any music anywhere like before that festival. And we have a radius. We have a interesting. Festival. Yeah, well, I'm gonna drag you out anyway. You, you bring uh, your mom too. Your mom is so cute. Yeah, you bring her. You guys can sit front row. I'll have the band play it. Or I'll just play the track and like I'll sing on top of it, and you could just be like, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, yeah, just do go under an alias, <laughs> or have your no, mom go up there and push push play <laughs> <laughs> on the record. I'll just play the track. I'll just play the track. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Do you have? Oh, well, you have another song. I at least one coming out together. It sounds like. Oh, we well, have I mean, so much music coming out together, so and they're okay. so good. I listen to them all the time. Oh, so good. Okay. I can't yeah, we wait need to, to hear figure it. out like which ones to release and timeline and all that. No, let these ones breathe for a bit. Yeah, they, these these ones need to breathe a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, they just came out. I was just curious because I know you're talking about this. You're you're hyping up this song that that we haven't heard yet. So I was just curious. I'm just uh, I'm yeah. honored. Are, are you excited? That, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I'm honored that uh the music that was just passion projects now it's like being played on the radio and stuff. I saw it was on XM. You know, it's on. Mm -hmm. KCRW, it's yeah. on. It's in. It's in. Like, there's some country. I got some report. It's in like Poland or something. What? I, wow. I was like, what? Like, how <laughs> is this even possible? Like, and then it, it was. This I, is I so good. Yeah, I, I have so many honor. friends messaging me. They're like, "Yo, that that new project is amazing." Like, people I'd never hear from really, or like people um from Saint Martin, you know, like just amazing. different places. They're like. This song is so good. I have it on repeat. And then people are like, um, for for reflex that it really touched them because you know, if you ever lost someone, you would know mm -hmm. how painful it is to not be able to change the change the timeline, you know, and it's just like um it's a powerful song. Like I cry to it all the time. I didn't I have no more tears left to give. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're both great records. Like I said, I I'm stuck. Right when I heard, it, I was like, "Whoa, okay, this is a this is definitely a beat banger." And then you get into Reflex, and it's it starts off slow. It's a beautiful song, and it even picks up there in the middle. So I, yeah, I mean, I, I love what you guys are doing. So I and I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Of course, thank you so much for having us. Yeah, of course. I have yeah. one more question for you both. Um, you already answered it a little bit, Spencer, or you did, but I'm gonna have, ask you again anyway. Yes, so. I will be singing at Spencer's wedding. <laughs> this is what you want okay. to know yeah that's the that was one of my last two questions so the other one is uh if you have any advice for aspiring artists mariam mariam you go oh, first and spencer my... but i want another answer for spencer see if oh, you can oh, remember oh, what he said yeah. the first time <laughs> no um so for aspiring artists i would say um trust in yourself do not defer responsibility to anybody else. And like, cause we often think that somebody else knows better, but everybody is just faking it, honestly. And just not faking it, but they're like going along. And so um, trust in yourself, trust in your vision, have a vision and um, like just ride out with it. And quality over quantity at all times is all about the quality of everything. Because when something is good, it'll like, like Spencer said, it'll cause, it'll be a wildfire on its own. You know, um, art is meant to bypass the senses. And I feel like the music we make and um, what we're doing bypasses the senses. Because when I listen to stuck, I'm just like, you know, I can't even control myself. But, you know, like that's what art should do for you. And so it's all about connecting and just being true to yourself. That's what I found the most. I love that. I love that. All right, Spencer, let's see if you... If, <laughs> Similar, see you similarly, I, for me, I think having authenticity as she said it's like don't change your vision because of any external factor uh and 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 
for me, the two biggest things to like remain in the music industry are patience and persistence. And it always comes down to patience and persistence for me because you have to be okay. Like at this point, when I get rejections, it's just like, oh, okay, whatever, you just move on, you know? And people who take rejections to heart, you're not meant for the music industry, you know? Like that's just a nature, like I, for every one success or one break I get, there are dozens of, of no's and, you know, this isn't good or this show isn't, you know, whatever, whatever. So, and, and also patience, I think is super, super important for, for the music industry, because maybe it's not in the world. Maybe it's not the right time for your sound to be, you know, sounds come and go. It gets dark and it gets light. It gets fast and it gets slow, at least in dance music. I, I noticed the trends over the years, it gets really popular to make really fast music and then aggressive music and then light music. It's like, the trends are always coming and going. Don't follow what's going on. Just like keep on doing your thing. And then yeah. if your thing crosses over with what the world is doing at that time, then boom, and it explodes. And then maybe, maybe you don't, you're not in the limelight for a bit and you're still doing your thing. And then the world crosses over with, with your thing and then boom, it explodes again. It's like, that's for me, those are my breaks. That's when, when that stuff happens where I'm just doing, I'm still doing my thing. I'm still moving forward. I'm doing my thing then the world somehow crosses over at that point. And then that's when something happens. I don't look at what the world is doing and then try to do something that fits in that time because that's when you lose authenticity. Yeah. I think you just got to chug forward, do your thing, do your thing, do your thing. And then if it explodes, it explodes. If it doesn't, then you're staying authentic. Like that's, that's how I, that's how I, that's my biggest advice. Just like do your thing and be patient. <laughs> Bring it back for you.